All right, you guys. Case number two. It is going to be an expert topic video. Yay. Super excited for it. So um, what are we talking about? It's a little bit of a news coverage story. It is a little bit of a deep dive uh, into a story. But I want to talk about DNA. All right. We have done multiple videos on DNA and in re reference to the Idaho for case. Now, um, what else could we possibly be bringing up? Right. Well, I have some very interesting information because, again, still today, right now, there are people out there who believe Brian Koberger is guilty. Um, and remember, I, I have no idea if Brian Koberger is guilty. I don't know. I, I don't have enough evidence to say he's guilty. I don't have enough evidence to say he's uh, a co-defendant. I don't have enough evidence to say he's innocent. I don't have enough evidence to say anything. I don't know. We don't have enough information. But uh, I do have a very interesting video for everyone that we are going to watch right here and then dig into the topic. All right. Ready? Go. Okay. Um, let's go from that to the story in Colorado for a moment. We talked about this on the show yesterday a little bit where the State's Bureau of Investigation releases the findings of an investigation they did into a, a former a forensic scientist accused of tampering with DNA tests. Uh, there's so many implications potentially from this. They, they found that this woman is named Yvonne Missy Woods manipulated data in the, in the testing process and posted incomplete test results in some cases. And there were thousands of cases she worked on now that are said to be in jeopardy. So the Boulder County DA, Michael Darty, is uh, joining us to talk a little bit more about this. Um, okay. Thank you, sir, for, for coming on. Uh, we had a brief report on this yesterday. Said, Boy, this really seems like it could be far reaching, have a lot of implications. What is the context we should look at this in? Well, good afternoon, and thank you so much for having me on. As a prosecutor, our mission is to do justice. We seek to do the right thing in every criminal case that we prosecute. So anytime there's a question about the integrity of the evidence or the credibility of a witness, it's, of course, a very serious matter. And as you know, over the years, DNA has come to be relied upon in so many criminal trials throughout the United States. So when this issue first came to our attention and to the public's attention four months ago, we were immediately concerned about the impact to victims, the accused, and cases throughout the justice system in Colorado. So this woman was like the, or at least the way it's been painted, what I've read, she was pretty much the star kind of DNA analyst and just worked on a lot of high profile cases, which you often see DNA use. You see them in a lot of cases, but she worked on so many and police relied on her, prosecutors relied on her. So if you found anomalies, right, what can you tell us specifically about what was found and then what might that lead to? Well, see, uh, what I would say is she certainly had a long and storied career with the state lab, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, and worked on, to your point, a lot of different cases. Four months ago, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation announced that they had discovered anon non excuse me, anomalies in her work. What that meant, we just learned more about today. So today, there was a release by the internal investigation mm -hmm. to this matter where they announced that she had deleted data, manipulated data, and tampered with evidence in an effort to cut corners. What I would highlight for your viewers, though, is that they remain steadfast, that she neither manipulated nor produced any false results that resulted in someone being wrongfully convicted or falsely implicated. And I think that's a key question for all of us. When you hear that a DNA lab analyst is engaged in some kind of misconduct, the immediate worry you have as a prosecutor, a juror, as an ordinary person on the street, is someone in prison right now right. who should not be? Or is someone free in the community who's actually a danger and should actually be in custody. Of course. Those two uh, concerns remain such a driving force for us. Today's release by the Colorado Bureau of Investigation emphasized that no one's been falsely implicated or wrongfully convicted as a result of her work, but that she did cut corners by deleting, manipulating, and tampering with data. And obviously that remains very disturbing. And I hope they're 
conclusion that uh, there's no one wrongfully implicated or exonerated is true and accurate. Okay, so obviously you're going to look into that. Let me put a statement up from her attorney, and then I want to ask you a follow-up on that, just so we have what they're uh, uh, saying on it. So the attorney here is uh, Ryan Brackley. So Ryan Brackley says, Ms. Woods expects nothing less than a full, complete professional investigation which into these allegations. Uh, stands by the reliability and integrity of her work on matters that were filed in court, and particularly in cases which she testified in court under oath. But you know, you're saying that Vardy been this separate investigation that found she cut corners. What do you look at next here as you build this out? So you're, you're saying you're not necessarily satisfied with the explanation. You don't know whether or not, you know, someone's in jail that shouldn't be. You, you don't, you just know what's in the report. That's correct. And uh, I would say there's still questions that remain to be answered. And there are important questions about how these things took place, how they weren't discovered earlier, and what it means in terms of the actual impact on cases. That's yet to be disclosed or determined. Plus, I would point out for you that even in cases where she did not cut corners, delete mm -hmm. data, or tamper with data, those defendants are likely going to seek to have their DNA results re-examined. Right. And they may seek to relitigate their cases. So even in cases where the state lab determined she did not engage in misconduct, that's certainly going to result in additional work for district attorney's offices, but also angst for the victims and their families of any of those cases that were touched by her. So this could spread far beyond just your jurisdiction is what you're saying, or? Oh, this is throughout the state of Colorado. It's certainly not just limited to Boulder County. Right. So it's a really, really big deal. All right. Um, thank you, sir. Michael Doherty with us um, on that situation. We'll continue to follow that. I and mean, we had it on yesterday, but now we understand it much better. Um, I have one question. That was shocking. How many people got put to death because of that? Those results. I hope none. Yeah, I hope not. Because uh, that's shocking. And just to just to clear it up, that video is a little old by days now or weeks. It is now into the thousands. Okay. And we have here Colorado's star DNA scientist intentionally. This is a more updated one. It, at first, when they were reporting on this, it was not intentional. It is now intentionally manipulated evidence for years, calling into question all of the criminal cases she worked on in her nearly three-decade career. According to a prelim investigation released by officials Friday, uh, Yvonne Missy Woods, a 29-year veteran of the agency crime lab who helped solve some of the state's most notorious crimes, abruptly left her post last November, which this investigation started in September. So, like, pushed out, you know what I mean? After the Colorado Bureau of Investigation discovered anomalies in her work and initiated a criminal probe, the agency released the findings, which asserts that Woods, long one of the Bureau's most respected analysts, purposefully altered DNA test results. For anybody out there that thinks DNA it's is. either yours or it's not black and white. Like your DNA is there. So you did it. Right. It's yours. Exactly. And you know, it, I, it's because there's no blind testing guaranteed. That woman was being talked to by the prosecutors and the investigators. So she made the DNA fit even when it didn't guaranteed. Exactly. Exactly. And that, I already know where this is going and I don't even know anything about any of it. Yeah, and uh, it's the issues we've been calling out with the process. It is the issues that we've been calling out. It it, it absolutely is. And, uh, you know, I, I found it very interesting and I just wanted to have an open conversation about it because that after I heard that, I was like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. So they're going to have to retry and go back over thousands of of cases because we see a blob which we talked about in these videos here being manipulated into potentially being a match when it shouldn't have been considered at all 
because of prosecutor involvement, because of investigator involvement, because of all these people that are involved that have a buy-in to the suspect being the right guy. It's terrifying, and it's also in direct relation with the Idaho 4 case because we've said it from the beginning. If you remove that DNA, what do they have? Right. Nothing. Not really, no. Nothing. And Koberger could be guilty. He could be. I just, I'm not suggesting he's innocent and this was all a setup. That could be true too, but that's not what I'm trying to get by here. What I'm trying to get by is that there's mega questions in the investigation. There are huge issues in this investigation that I'm seeing, and I am nervous. I am nervous for a fair trial. I'm nervous that we have the right guy. I'm nervous that the actual perpetrators of this crime could still be out there. That terrifies me. I don't. Agreed. It terrifies me, too, because that means people are still at risk and the cops think they got their guy. So they're not going to assume the two crimes are connected, just like they didn't think that Buddy the dog could be connected to this. They didn't think the you know car in Oregon could be connected to this. Like, how much do we know? How much did they verify? Yeah. Did do they just like? Did they just believe the DNA the way they just believed this woman? Right. Because it's science, you guys. Science is a hundred percent accurate all the time. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Not when it's susceptible to human error. That is the issue we're seeing with DNA is that them reading and I'm not even talking about IgG. I'm let's let's not talk about IgG at all. Let's talk about just matching. Yeah. A profile to a profile. A sample from a crime scene to a buccal swab. That comparison can be so subjective. So is it science? It I don't think it's science until it's blind tested until That's the we issue. don't know uh you know what the outcome is. That's the yeah, only real because, science there is because to that's back what a they're hypothesis. doing. That's what they're doing. Yeah. They are so they're taking these samples. They have the end result already. They're yes, they're going to the expert, the DNA expert and they're saying, "Hey, this is my defendant and this is what this guy did. This is a crime scene. Does this DNA match this DNA? And now that scientist basically has all of that case information when they never needed it to just make an analysis and say, does it match or does it not? And right. then you, the investigators are being a part of the process and you have anomalies like we talked about in the past, like a blob, which you guys, um, if you haven't seen that, it's in the video. We'll put it on the screen where we where we dug into this extensively. Um you know, they have anomalies. It's called an artifact. It's called a blob where like it's dust in the machine. Um, you have situations where, you know, because it looks like a graph where there's like these little humps for each allele. You'll have a hump that's really small. And that means there's not enough of that. There's not enough there to be able to tell mm -hmm. if that's even an actual marker or not. Right. And they'll say, oh, no, that's a match. Like, you have the investigators in there saying, well, there's a hump, so that's got to ma be a match. But they're not an expert, so they don't understand what that means. Yeah. They don't understand that me that means it's inconclusive, that right. you can't tell that. Right. That, that the test needs to be repeated multiple times to be able to see, okay, is that signal or is it just noise? Right. That that with that blob there, instead of that counting towards the percentage of likelihood, it, it should be counted against the percentage of likelihood. So like if you have a 10 marker match but you have a blob that's big enough to cover two of the, what is it? LLs or whatever. Um, and there's six that are matching a blob and two that aren't matching instead of being an 80% match. It's, should be a 60% match, but you have experts coming up here that are working with the prosecutors and saying, well, that's covering two of them. So technically, I mean, that could be a match on those two, 
Uh, we just don't know, but it's being presented as a match. It's being added into the percentage of likelihood that it is a match in this suspect. And, you know, I keep saying this when this gets brought up. So it, when it comes to that's talking about DNA, like DNA, bodily fluids, hairs, spit, anything that comes with that BLO, D, um, I mean, we're just when, talking about any sample when we're talking about now trace DNA or fingerprint DNA, um, it, it becomes even less likely and trustworthy than standard DNA. And I've said from the beginning that our law enforcement, not law enforcement, our military does not allow trace DNA, does not allow fingerprint DNA. Um, in the in their court systems because they look at it as a pseudoscience. So then I started think, well, what what DNA do they allow? You know, and I started looking into the Department of Defense has one of the biggest labs in the entire U.S. because they put so much emphasis on IDing fallen soldiers and like they're working from fifty years past to still ID soldiers that you know they've had. DNA samples that have been mixed in with gas that have been mixed in with or blown up or uh, in salt water for an extended period of time. Like these are degraded samples. Yeah, yeah, these are these are really in-depth practices around DNA. The military knows what they're doing with DNA. They have their own scientists that are involved in this and some of the most cutting edge and leading technology. And they're saying, hey. No trace DNA, no way. It is not reliable enough to hold our soldiers accountable to potential crime using this. We don't trust it, okay? That is their scientists and their own attorneys saying that. Now, I have uh, another report that was published in 2015 that says, you know, forensic DNA evidence is not infallible. And it goes into the questions around trace DNA specifically and how most of the time when you're building a trace DNA sample, every time you're manipulating that sample and they take pieces of that broken sample, which is what we believe to rebuild the sample in the Idaho four case is what they did. They add it to like uh, another human sample with like metallic, uh, a, a metallic base that causes that sample to bind to it and then gives them a more legible, readable sample. But every step in that process of conducting that, which is probably also similar to what we see in the IgG, but more an electronic route versus the DNA route, uh, are problematic. Those are problems. Every single step of manipulation and altering causes a uh, variable that makes it less reliable. And uh, the uh, the federal courts came out and 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 talked specifically about touch DNA analysis. It feels like there's like two people working this right now we you have half of the federal government that's like no we this is not tested enough this is not trustworthy enough and this report is from uh 2019 talking about how dna is supposed to be the gold standard of criminal evidence and uh it's not yeah it's not there's problems there are problems <laughs> that need to be tested over and over and over again in blind testing fashion. They need to be able to be repeatable, which is interesting because in the Idaho four case, it you know what it, you know what it can't be repeatable repeated because it was single source. No single source Not, means uh, it was a single test. It, it was only enough to test a single time because when you test DNA, it ruins it. And there were so few cells that it could only be tested once. And that is what they're hindering their DNA sample on. Yeah, it, that title says everything. It, Federal court says that touch DNA is mostly guesswork that can't be used as evidence. I, I know. Yeah, that's insane. Like, I, that's a wonderful article. <laughs> I know. Um, and it goes in here to talk about the fact that 
uh, touch DNA or trace DNA um, adds so many variables to the crime scene that it's not even worth using right now because once it is touch DNA, once it is trace DNA, you immediately don't know how it got there. You don't know if it came to the crime scene on the weapon. You don't know if it came to the crime scene on the perpetrator's hands. Uh, you know, it, in the Wikipedia article, when I was doing research onto this, it gives you a breakdown of some cases, which I, I'll try and post it on the edit portion or have it posted on the edit portion, but it talks about multiple cases that have been proven to be false over the last decade where somebody's DNA was on the crime scene and they were able to prove 100% that they were somewhere else multiple cases and that's because it's trace and touch dna which is the same thing but yeah hmm. interesting it right it's interesting and it it when i'm looking at this when i'm doing this research because i feel like i i'm researching into dna at least once a week and when i'm looking into it it makes me think that man i feel bad for people that have such strong faith in our justice system that they look at that evidence and think dang it was definitely him yeah like why i go real philosophical and i think well do these people realize that if we're not right that we have killers that are free out there. We've made a fifth victim and we have a killer who's going to create even more victims. Like that's, it, it is so bad. Like it's terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. It's we, literally we've said this, terrifying. We've literally said this so many times, but yes, I mean, that's what's important here is we want the right person off the streets. And if we don't have the right person, we need to know that. Like we need to be, sure of that and if we're going to put somebody to death we need to be sure of their guilt these kind of inconsistencies in dna especially the type that is being used in the idaho 4 brian koberger case need to be looked at and just ignoring them and shoving them away and saying it's all conspiracy and and you know dna is either yours or it's not and you know they got his dna so he's the killer that does not mean you're right. That does not mean that's the truth. Just because you think that's the most logical answer. That's subjective. Like the science shows this type of DNA, this type of analysis with this type of DNA can be really, really unreliable in a lot of ways. And we need to understand that. Like, that is what it is. That's what's being shown through the science. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to understand that and we need to say, okay, well, then there needs to be more evidence backing this up. So if if they come to court and this is their only real solid thing that they're leaning on, it's like, well, yeah, we have camera footage and we know this is for sure his car and we know he was driving down Main Street at this time. So he's it's got to be him. I mean, look, he was driving in Moscow late at night around the time of the murders and his DNA is at the crime scene, but they have no footage of him entering the neighborhood. They have right. no footage of anything else. Like he's nowhere near that house from any of the camera footage uh, or I'm or the, the car questions. is a different car or, you know, it shows like in the footage that he never got, even got out of the car or yeah. you know what I mean? Like there's I, do. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it could be. I Who have no knows? Idea. Just there needs to be proof that was his car in that neighborhood putting him there. Yeah, I'm just worried that we're so far into the investigation. I want to read something too here, um, going back to what we were talking about. But I'm really worried that we're so far into the investigation that at this point, if he's able to prove, Brian Koberger is able to prove that for somehow it's not him and he's not involved in any way, that Idaho State is going to go down the hole of saying, we had the right guy. 
We had the right guy. We just didn't have the right evidence. We had the right guy. Our jury just didn't think it was the right guy. Like Which Casey we've Anthony. Seen yeah. All the time. Well, Casey all Anthony's actually the guilty. Time. But at least but, I think so. So this says, like like Malia was saying, federal court says touch DNA analysis is mostly guesswork that can't be used as evidence. DNA was supposed to be the gold standard of criminal evidence, yep. and it can be, but only under very specific circumstances, rarely found in the messy world of crime scenes. DNA evidence is easily contaminated by the people handling the evidence, not to mention anyone else who's been at the crime scene. Oh, no. Hmm. Oh, like no. a crime scene not managed Properly. Like all of those people in and out of the crime scene, literally before the cops were even there. Mm -hmm. This has resulted in law enforcement agencies spending years chasing phantom criminals, which we've covered one of those. How it many? Was almost a decade of them chasing the person that packaged the swabs in, in Germany. Germany. Yeah. Yeah. The Phantom of Heilberg or whatever. Yep. So, how many of those people that were in that crime scene had ever met Koberger? I like I don't through know. through law enforcement, and through, I don't know if we're through gonna get that. a laboratory, through yeah. anything. Like if there's through a connection, law enforcement degree. I if know. there is a connection between him and anyone that went to that crime scene that that day, I know. That's I know. boom, huge yeah. deal. Or, or connection between him and one of the survivors. Yep. Like, yeah. or if he'd ever been who to that house what? before, but right. just didn't know whose house it was, or he or, had contact with somebody who, like at Mad was Greek, at that house, ate, yeah. ate at the Mad Greek for sure, and then 100%. Maddie served him and went home. Yep. But there's proof he was never at the house. Yeah, I know. And, and like, come on, there there's so many ways. Million tests, and maybe we'll go into those tests again since we have so many new subscribers and viewers and everything. Uh, after watching this on uh, the True Crime Talk Show. But uh, this has resulted in law enforcement agencies spending years chasing phantom criminals only to find out the DNA investigators kept finding at crime scenes came from other officers, first responders, or even the person packing their DNA kits back at the manufacturer. Uh, but the myth that DNA evidence is nigh infallible persists. None, some of this is due to the inscrutable nature of the processes that turn stray cells into evidence. Some of this is due to the forensic experts overstating the certainty of their findings. Exactly. When DNA evidence is pretty much the only evidence holding a case together, the evidence had better be solid. A federal court in Michigan has found that the framework behind one company's STR mix, DNA evidence testing, is a cobbled together mess that sounds nice and sciencey, but isn't much more than overly educated guesswork. And I want to repeat that. When DNA evidence is pretty much the only evidence holding a case together, then the evidence had better be solid. Boom. Meaning there needs to be no uncertainty. It needs to be, what is it? The quad, quadrillion? The five... I don't even remember the number right now. 5.6 quadrillion? Octillion. Or octillion. Yeah, octillion. 5.6 octillion that it's Brian Cooper. You would he you would be expected to hear things like that when you need it solid if your case isn't solid. Yeah, because that's an absurd number that makes no sense. Correct. There's not there's never been that many humans. Like they literally they history. literally there's made, never been half. They made that number up. To make it sound solid. Yeah. They they exaggerated. That is an exaggeration. And it's so blatant. There's no yes. point in stating a number like that. Literally no point. Except to make it seem like it is so absolutely. You're so absolutely certain it's his. Yeah. To make the public convinced of that. Right. That's because what that, you call jury tampering. That is well, yeah. I mean, that would be hard to prove, but 
uh, that's what you call character assassinating. Um, that's what you call up to that's it. Like, I understand it's that implanting. It's, it's implanting. Hard. It's yeah. implanting things in people's minds. Yeah, an idea. And it's wrong. Yeah. It is totally yeah. jury tampering, even though it, there's no way you're ever going to win that argument in a court of law, unfortunately. No, you just wouldn't have the evidence for it. I think it's just character assassination, which you see all the time. We see... In this case, a lot of times the prosecution and the defense does it. And I guess as long as it's fair, whatever. But um, I really just wish we had science that was actual science. And what I mean by that is no subjectivity. That they weren't allowed to know who the suspect's profile was. That the prosecutor was not allowed to talk to the analysts. That the investigators, the investigators couldn't either. talk to the analysts. That the science is submitted through a third party and the analyst or scientist is not allowed to have contact with the law enforcement. It is a need. It is an absolute need. And it, it makes me so worried. When you see such resistance in law enforcement against this idea, why? Why do you feel like you need a, a back pocket ticket? Th they should be for blind testing with DNA Agreed. because that will get them the most accurate information. I agree. I agree. There's no room for tunnel vision there. There's no room for making the puzzles pieces fit. So why do they not want it? Because yeah. they want to be able to make the puzzle pieces fit. They yeah. want there to be them to be able to push it in a certain direction. And that's wrong. Yeah. I'm and gonna... I'm not, I'm not putting everyone in a box. I'm sure there's some law enforcement that are very much for blind testing, but all of them need to be forced into it because yeah. it's needed. Yeah. And I'm going to include this article in here. It goes into, uh, it goes in depth into an actual case where, you know, they're, they're able to prove that based on the DNA that the expert gave, it's not what it appears to be. Um, and you know, that's really intriguing. Situations like this need to be highlighted more because we need to read goal, through that case. The goal needs to be to get more suspects less wrongful convictions. Yes. You, do you realize it has been proven? I don't remember what the number is, uh, but it's in the double digits that we've put people to death that were found out later 100% to be innocent. Oh, yeah. There's a search for answers about what happened inside this forensic lab in Jefferson County. Now, almost 30 years of work by a DNA analyst at CBI is under the microscope. It's fairly bad. Whenever... You have a lab analyst that uh, alters data um, in a forensic case file. That's bad. Phil Danielson is an expert witness on DNA. He says what CPI has discovered in Missy Woods' work raises so many questions. You're going to court and you're presenting the jury with an incomplete or, in fact, an untrue representation of the evidence. An internal affairs investigation found Woods manipulated data, impacting more than 650 cases since 2008. There could be more, as the agency is still reviewing cases that date back to 1994. So the question that we're all asking is, how does this scandal, and there's no other word for it, it's a scandal, from the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, impact these cases, and we're still figuring that out. District Attorney Brian Mason in Adams County wants more specifics. What is clear, though, this creates a ton of work for prosecutors who now must review cases. And it requires us now to not only review those cases and determine whether or not they need to be relitigated in any way, it means calling victims and victims' families and explaining to them the case that was resolved years ago now may not be resolved anymore. The agency says Woods didn't make up DNA matches. Instead, she cut corners and excluded some results. After Woods worked on cases for decades, CBI became aware of potential issues last September. The timeline is creating questions too. Exactly how did this come to light? Colorado's Public Defender Office says this investigation will likely mean many criminal cases will be reopened. They want to know if anyone has been wrongfully convicted. Woods' attorney says his client has never given false testimony that's resulted in a false conviction. You think about 
all the layers of something like this and then contacting victims' families. Mm -hmm. You thought things were over. Um, the, just this sheer amount of court cases. Yes, and, and the amount of work and the amount of money, too. The state has already requested millions of dollars to not only retest these cases, but potentially retry these cases. This is a lot of work that has been put on people. Goodness. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Wow. I think it, the, the false Ooh. conviction rate is about 5%, but that may not even be the true number because mm -hmm. we don't find out a lot of times yeah. we never find out. Yeah. But, uh, you know, let those thoughts riot in the comments below and, uh, we'll be talking about this more. And if you want to see us read through that case, cause I'm intrigued. I want to read through that case you were talking about, um, on the true crime talk show. Let us know. Yeah. I mean, we, We'll bring this to the okay. true crime talk show that you're going to see right after this. Okay, so um, we will read yeah. through it. I want to read it. 